بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله وفى نعمه ويكافى ومزيدا يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصيفنا أن عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملا العلى إلى يوم الدين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى تلف الأرض ومن عليها أنت خير وارثين نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير ونفع انتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحفاء على تمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء للهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وشلة ومرضاتي وقربي وقوابه سبحانه وتعالى Now our teachers they tell us about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the affair of religion is an affair of hearts and the human being distinguished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only in terms of his form but also in terms of his innate or his internal reality and is distinguished by the heart and likewise by what the heart does and one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we've heard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted man was man and that man was a special man the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and what we engage inshallah tabarakallah ta'ala in our discourse is one of the sort of great sort of renditions of love ultimately one of the great things that the heart does which is to what is to um, vent or to shower love upon an object that is deemed beloved and this is one of the greatest sort of declarations of love that the world has ever witnessed and it authored by one of the great Imams of Islam whose name is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Sa'id al-Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala who was an Imam who came forth in a great period of Islam which was the seventh um, century of Islam a century that many of the ulama radiallahu anhum wardahum they consider the golden age of Islamic scholarship when we mean by scholarship we don't just here mean the working of the mind but scholarship the working of the heart and by extension also the working of the soul also he's one of those great individuals mashallah tabarakallah who came forth from one of the greatest circles that we know in terms of Islam from the circle of Abu al-Baris al-Mursi rahimahullah ta'ala and the names maybe some of us may not be familiar with but these are no doubt whatsoever people who have earned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love by loving those realities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires for man to love in a tradition which is beautiful gives us a sense of the reality of those who are mentioned upon earth and why we study Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala radiallahu anhu warda yeah, and it's seven centuries after his passing. He died in the year 694 after the flight of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina. But in the tradition inside of Al Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ, he spoke about the affair of love, divine love, Allah's love. Allah's love. That when God loves a slave, he summons the Archangel Gabriel. وَيَقُولُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا Allah Ta'ala says, Verily, I love so-and-so. فَأَحِبُّهُ So love him. فَأَحَبُّهُ جِبْرِيلًا And Gabriel thereby loves that individual. فَذَحَبَ جِبْرِيلًا Gabriel thereby goes إِلَى الْمَلَأُ الْأَعْلَىٰ To the Supreme Assembly. And the Supreme Assembly are the greatest beings that God has created. Uh, the beings from the archangels, the beings from the spirits of the prophets and the messengers themselves. We live in the highest echelon of the, of the universe known as Aliyin, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it in the Quran. Fanade Jibreel, so Gabriel thereby calls out, Inna Allah yuhibbu fulan, and verily God loves so and so. Fahibuhu, so thereby love him, the instruction of Gabriel to the Malak. And Gabriel alayhi salam, when he instructs the mala, it's an instruction on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know inside of those great nights that we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's due pleasure and due love. The night of the Nisf al-Sha'ban or the night of Laylatul Qadr. Those nights in which Gabriel alayhi salam manifests in true reality and he informs all of the mala, the supreme assembly and by extension the entire angelic realm of what is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. And in this instance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed love for a specific individual upon the face of the earth. 
فأحبوه the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said and they by love him فإذا أحبوه and when they love him يوضع له القبول في الأرض then acceptance upon the face of the earth is granted and one of the ways that we know علامات القبول of the signs of acceptance is that we find an individual upon the tongues of human beings we find an individual inside of the hearts of human beings يعني عبر الدهور throughout the vicissitudes of time Allah Ta'ala says, as for that which benefits humanity, it remains upon the face of the earth. And so when we, in a distant land, some of our dear brothers call it the land of the caves, Nottingham. When we can mention somebody 700 years after the fact, it's no doubt whatsoever a sign, that acceptance upon the face of the earth has been granted for that individual. And that man is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Sa'id al Busayri, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam of the highest degree. And from his circles came Imams of the highest degree, the likes of Ibn Sayyid al Nas, radiallahu ta'ala, and who were the likes of the great Andalusi Imam, Abu Hayyan al Tawhidi, rahimahullah ta'ala. He likewise come out of great circles. He came out of the circles, as we said, of Abu al Bars al Mursi, who come out of the circles of Abu Hassan al Shadri, who come out of the circles of Abdul Salam ibn Mashish, who came out of the circles of the great Imam Shu'ib, Abu Madian, radiallahu anhu wa rawa halumma jarra, from circle to circle to circle to the supreme circle. The circle of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallama, a circle in which you would find Gabriel himself, a circle in which you would find Mikhail himself. A circle in which you would find the great archangel Israfil himself. An entire year Israfil could not leave the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. One entire year as in the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. A circle in which you find the others, Malak al-Mawt, Azrael, the great angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you only but knew a circle in which you find the Lord himself, Jalla Jalalu ta'ala And that is why he is Muhammad, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As his grandfather said, Abdul Muttalib, Rujuwan and Yuhmadu fil Ardi wa Sama. Called Muhammad, as his grandfather said, in the hope that he would be praised in the heavens as well as upon earth. And he's praised in the heavens and he's praised upon earth. And this is just one expression of praise and dedication of love that we see come forth from the Umbar of the Prophet. No doubt, yani the most oft recited poem in the history of man, the Burda Rabbim al Busayri. No doubt the most oft commented upon poem in the history of man. And he commented upon in virtually every single language of the human being where Islam is spread to. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. An Imam who is embraced by the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallama because he understood his purpose in life. Allah ta'ala creates us for a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates us for a purpose and in purpose. And one of the great realities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah, binds his universe together with is this reality that is known as love. And there's a tradition that they make mention of, and ulama make, make mention of it in terms of whether the transmission holds true, although they say that the meaning no doubt holds true. In it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was meant to have said, Kuntu kenzan makhfiyan wa wuditu an u'raf. Kuntu kenzan makhfiyan wa wuditu an u'raf. And I was a hidden treasure, God speaking. I was a hidden treasure and I loved to be known. Loved to be known. Here when we look at the tradition in and of itself, we see the reality of the divine. I was a hidden treasure, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Encapsulated inside the statement of the Prophet وسلم, inside of the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, where the Prophet وسلم, is, sitting, is sitting in one of those golden circles, those opportune moments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affords man in order to connect not only with him, but to connect with his Prophet وسلم, through him. And so we see in the tradition that one of the great Imams, his name is Imran ibn Hussein, radiallahu anhu, Sahaba Jalil, companion of the Rasul. He said, I'm sitting with the Prophet وسلم, and the people of Yemen that they come forth. And that's important because the Prophet وسلم, likewise in the tradition in the Bukhari and Muslim, he describes some of the unique realities of the people of the Yemen. The Prophet وسلم, said, Ataakum ahl al Yemen, that the people of Yemen have come unto you. Hum wa afida. It concerns our topic that they have the most yani, tender of hearts and softness of souls. The Prophet describes them. 
and the qualities that are essential, and it's from the distinguishing reality of the human being, as we said, to be given a heart, to be given a spirit, a special spirit. Angels are pure spirit, but the spirit of man is a higher reality. Allah Ta'ala calls it Ruhi. Allah calls it my spirit. God calls it inside the Quran. And so the spirit of man and all of those extended, fast, extended facets of the human spirit, whether you call it heart, whether you call it intelligence, or whether you call it self-ego, that they're distinguishing, they separate man from the entire creation. And of the highest distinguished realities of the human heart is when the heart is al yen or Arak, as the Prophet said about the people of Yemen, when it's soft and when it's tender. It becomes the seat of this great manifestation that we know is love, that binds the entire universe together, as we said. And at Taqum they came. Imran ibn Hussein, he said that when they entered into the Prophet ﷺ's presence inside of that golden circle, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Ahl al Yemen, Khudil Bishar. He said, O oh, people of Yemen, take the glad tidings, take the good news. After whom the people of the Najd, the people of the Najd, Banu Tamim, have refused it, the Prophet ﷺ has said. And they say to the Prophet, ya Rasulullah, we accept the actual glad tidings or messenger of Allah. And then they asked the Prophet sallallahu a question. And their question is about God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet sallallahu first words is, Kan Allah wa lam yakun shay'un ma'a. God was, and there was nothing besides God. And kuntu kenzan makhfiyan. I was a hidden treasure. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of the Quran in Surah Al-Dhariyat. Surah Al-Dhariyat is about scattered creation. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala scatters his creation in the earth up, in the horizons. And in that there's a, a, a pinnacle verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ jinna wal insa إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِ That I never created sprite, jinn, and mankind, save to worship me, يَعْبُدُونِ To worship me. That's our purpose, created with that purpose, to worship God. Worship God in what way? Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he interpreted the verse, he said, Ayli yarifunani, I to know me, to know. And so when we see the, the, the origin, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was, and there was nothing besides him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we see the affair of man, and his purpose is to worship, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What binds the worship of man with the reality of God? were did to love. That's what Allah Ta'ala says. That's what binds the statement, Kuntu Kenzen Mahfiyan Fa Wadid to love and Uraf to be known, to be worshipped. And so that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sahih Wa Sallama is going to stress the affair of the heart and stress the affair of the workings of the heart, that reality that has multiple names inside of the language of the Arabs. And in the Arabic language they say Kathratul Asma Tadullu ala Sharaful Musamma. But any reality that bears several names, numerous names, it only serves to indicate Sharaful Musamma, the nobility of that entity, the nobility of that essence. And so here we speak about love and we speak of one of the great lovers of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahih wa Sallama, the great Imam al Busayri. The human being, just like the sprite, that they have ways where they can express their love. Human. Beings and sprites are similar creatures. Both creatures, they inhabit this sort of small entity that is known as air. And they differ from one to another. In that when we look at the sprite, the sprite in terms of what Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala has what engaged him, which is the reality of poetry, the sprite excel in poetry. I mean, they speak normally through poetry. The sprite, the jinn, our brothers from the jinn. Languages of two types, languages of what is poetry and prose, as we hear in English language. Quran, as we heard recite in the beginning, is neither poetry nor is it prose. Because it's not kalam bashar, as Allah Ta'ala says in the It's not human speech. But when we look at human speech as well as the speech of the sprite, it is both poetry as well as prose. Then sagacity, high intellect, always expresses itself through poetry. 
always expresses itself through poetry, high intellect. So the sprites who are beings of high, yani bewildering mind, bewildering intellect, that they express best through poetry. And the sprites are far beyond the human being in terms of intellectual capacity. And that is why, as an example, that they're born as adults. They don't have children. They don't have children from amongst the sprites. They're born mukallafun. They're born in a state of legal and moral and ethical responsibility in front of the Lord. As opposed to the human being, he goes through a period of, what, nine years, 10, 12, 13, 15, with most ulama, 18, with the school of Imam Malik, goes through several years before maybe he comes into this reality that is known as what is legal responsibility. One of the signs of the great sagacity of our brothers from the jinn is what is when they can speak in such high language. Likewise, amongst man, and then we see man begin to utter realities through what this great medium known as poetry, then that no doubt whatsoever, regardless of content, that renders somebody to be of a high intellectual capacity and disposition. And that is why we see that the Prophet was sent amongst very special people. As we hear the verse that was recited, that it has come a messenger unto you, from you, from amongst you, the Prophet. That in the generic sense, because the ulama radiallahu anhum wa ardahum, they say, Al-ibra bi umum Allah sabab. That what we take into consideration is the general application of the term la bi khusus sabab not the specific reason why that verse manifested, for example. And so here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about anfusakum, min anfusikum, and he from you, and he from us. Sharaf. I mean that's nobility. That we're from the same stock as the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sahib wasallam. Nobility that we're from his same stock. If we only but knew, and when you gaze in the mirror and you see a face, you should praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the face. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ had a face. And when you look inside of that face and you see eyebrows, and you see eyes, and you see eyelashes, and you see a nose, and you see cheeks, you see lips. For men, you may see a moustache and a beard. Problematic if a woman sees a moustache and a beard, but we'll let that slide. Uh, but if you see it, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you see it. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ had it. And then the Imams radiallahu anhum will go further that if you gaze into your reality when you gaze in the mirror and that you see something that resembles his even more so. So as an example, somebody has a da'aj, they have like eyes like the Prophet ﷺ, white eyeballs and extremely black cornea and pupils, larger eyes, maybe somewhat oriental in nature, then you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a greater portion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see glimpses glimpse of it like in the tradition of Sayyidina Mu'ad ibn Jabal, the Bukhari and others with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi just prior to his death he meets Mu'ad ibn Jabal beyond the actual what city of Medina to Manawara, sending them in the direction of those people whose hearts are soft and souls are tender the people of Yemen. The direction in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Inni ajidu nafas al-Rahman min qibl al-Yemen. That verily I inhale the breath of the all merciful. Allah, coming from the direction of the Yemen, the Prophet ﷺ said, that the Rahman, what does the Rahman mean to you? The Rahman, Imam al-Raqi Suhani, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says the Rahman is the bestower of love. That's what the name means, Ar-Rahman. Bestower of the yani, grand love bites, quote unquote. Although there are more subtle love bites that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows by virtue of his name, Ar-Rahim subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what does he say to Sayyidina Mu'ad ibn Jabal? Ya Mu'ad, inni uhibbuka. Oh Mu'ad, I love you. And what is it that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi loves about Sayyidina Mu'ad ibn Jabal? Of the ulama radiallahu anhum wardahum, you see, of the things that he loves about, of, about Mu'ad ibn Jabal is his eyes. Because his eyes are ad'aj. But the eyes of Mu'ad are just like the eyes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And so the imams radiallahu anhum wardahum, that they're going to inform us that we should be, find favor and grace bestowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us whenever we share any type of what of qualities 
or yani, physical characteristics with the Prophet himself sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And this is about reattachment to the divine to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only way you reattach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the Prophet himself sallallahu wa sallam. It's something that the generation in which we're in that we must come into knowledge of because that's the first and glorious generation we will make oft reference to known as the companions themselves radiallahu anhum wardahum. That's what made them extremely special. That's why their age was called Menhaj al Nabuwa, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called it, and the age of prophecy, because they were cloaked in the mantle of prophecy, radiallahu anhum wardahum. And no matter what has happened since then, no matter what has happened, and that's a lot of discussion for us to have, because what has happened is still happening inside of the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we find comfort in the words of the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Ta'udunna ila Menhaj al Nabuwa, that you will return back to that way. And if people, end of time scenario, will be clothed in the mantle of the Messenger of Allah Himself, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. And it's the beauty of this ummah, mashallah, tabarakallah, is anything that connects to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is still preserved. And when we speak about the words of Al Busayri, rahimahullah ta'ala, which is about a mantle and the cloak of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, that reality which, what, which embraced his form. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, sallam covered, clothed his form. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Menhaj al Nabuwa, he attributed great worth to that radiallahu anhu wa rda'hu. In the tradition of Sayyidina Abdurrahman ibn Awf and others, and that we hear of a, of a woman, and an extremely beautiful woman, radiallahu anha wa rda'ha, that she what she makes a beautiful shirt for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bi yadayha, with her own hands. And she goes unto the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallama amongst his companions. And then she says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, O Messenger of Allah, verily I made this shirt for you, just for you to wear. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, as we know from the distinguishing qualities of Nubu'ah or prophecy, is that he never refuses a gift, sallallahu alayhi wa sallama. So she presents the shirt to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama and he accepts the shirt. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Amma Rabbika, Hadith, Allah Ta'ala says, As for the blessings of your Lord, Hadith, declare them, proclaim them, yani show them. And so the Prophet said, immediately in the circle, the golden circle, arises, enters into his house, and he comes out, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wearing the shirt, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this beautiful woman had made with her own hands. And then the woman then addresses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she says to him, Ya Rasulullah, I said you could wear it, not have it. Give me my shirt back. <laughs> she says to the Rasul. And so the Prophet Sa'isam smiles. Uh, and then the Prophet Sa'isam simply enters his house. And then he, he takes up the shirt, folds it neatly, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, exits the house, and he gives it to this beautiful woman. Mahu, yani, what is it that the woman desired? She desired something that had clothed God, the Messenger of Allah. That, what is that? What's inside of your heart? And then we personalize it because maybe our journey is, is a personal journey. Yeah, the nature of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a personal relationship. And if our relationship with, the, with Allah ta'ala is personal, then likewise our relationship with His Prophet, His Beloved, His Habib, likewise has to be personal. Uh, what's inside of her heart? And what, what is inside of our hearts? And what's inside of your heart? And you know when you hear the name of the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and it litmus test, and it, what happens inside of your heart? What happens upon your tongue? Huh? says, your tongue is a good indication of what's going on inside of your heart. And we have one of the great Imams of Ahlul Islam, Imam Malik ibn Anas, radiallahu anhu I mean, we're trying to sort of test hearts now, because we, we look at the hearts of great people, we can begin to see where our hearts are. So Imam Malik, Imam Dar al Hijra, Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam of Medina to Manawara, nearly 90 years in Medina to Manawara, 90 years, he only leaves Medina once in his life, just to go to Hajj. Couldn't leave the city of light, the city of the Prophet. And in that city, he never wore sandals, never wore shoes, out of respect for the soil. What type of heart is that? And in that city, the Imam radiallahu anhu wa he never answers yani, the, the call to nature in the city. 
He goes beyond the city. And he can't put his fadalat, he can't put his extraneous entities inside of the city of Medina to Munawwara radiallahu anhu wa Must go beyond. So when he sits in front of his teachers, you know, when you're going to sit in front of teachers, Fulan is a great teacher. Fulan is mashallah. Fulan has maqam, ma'allah. Great teacher, position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's got to experience the reality himself. So Imam Malik radiallahu anhu wa when he'd sit with his teachers, he would wait for one thing, one thing alone. What was that? Just to hear the name of the Prophet sallallahu Just the name. When he heard the name of the Prophet Sallallahu he'd look inside of his teacher for reaction. If he saw no reaction, he'd get up and walk. This ain't a teacher for me. And if somebody's not affected by the name of the Prophet Sallallahu how can they be affected? And how can they affect? And how can they pass it on to me? And so, lo and behold, when you look at the likes of the teachers of Imam Malik ibn Anas, radiallahu anhu wa you see strange qualities inside of those teachers. Like the great Muhammad ibn Munkadir, rahimahullah ta'ala. You know, why is Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu respecting the soil of Medina? Because he said, I would find our, our dear teacher, Muhammad ibn Munkadir, rahimahullah, the Imam of the Masjid of the Prophet, sallam, teacher of Malik and great Imams of the, of the Atba'a Tabi'in. We would find him rolling inside of the dirt of Medina to Munawwara. <clears throat> We'd ask, yeah, Imam, what are you doing rolling inside on the floor? He would say, the earth in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam What does that mean? I mean, meaning if you can't get the shirt, then at least get the earth. Clothe yourself in the earth that he tread upon sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallam. Muhammad ibn Munkadir, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, often we will be sitting with Muhammad ibn Munkadir inside of his circles. Remember, he's in the masjid of the Rasul. He's the imam of the masjid of the Rasul, saying that Muhammad ibn Munkadir. And there's Imam Malik amongst the students inside of that great circle. And he says, often the Imam would be teaching, then he would fall silent, begin to weep, jump up and run and jump on top of the grave of the Prophet. I mean, like unexplainable. Someone teaching a class, all of a sudden he falls silent, begins to weep uncontrollably, as he will say, Rahimullah Ta'ala, as alluded to inside those initial verses that we're going to read, that he would immediately go to the actual grave of the Prophet on top of the grave, on top of it. You know, in our day and age, you know, if you hear on top of the grave of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi people's hearts shake in an opposite direction. They turn in a different way. And cave okay, someone on top of the grave. Shirk hadha. To be on top of the grave of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such a person, yeah, maybe not fit to be inside the Ummah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at one of those, Caliph, who becomes a Caliph. He was the governor of war of Medina to Munawwar. His name is, his name is Abdul Malik ibn Marwan ibn al Hakam. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He comes, he's the governor of Medina. He later becomes the caliph of Banu Umayya, one of the Khulafa, uh, the vice gerents of Banu Umayya. He comes inside of the masjid of the Rasul, and then as he comes inside of the mosque, he notices. What does he notice to his shock and horror? He notices somebody on top of the grave of the Prophet, وسلم, on top of the grave, weeping uncontrollably, on top. Not besides, uh, not in proximity, but on top. So he goes, he says, way haka, and what are you doing? He says, yeah, he rebuking the man. And the man just turns towards him and says, Samirtu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul. I hear the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, woe to you when people who are not fit are placed in authority over you. Uh, when people who are not fit for leadership are placed in authority over you. And who was the man? Khalid ibn Zayd, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Sahabi Jalil, the first house that the Prophet sallallahu alighted in, descended in, you know, that talal. Busayri will speak about the talal. Uh, like Imam al-Qais will say, yani, yani, qifa nabki min dhikra habibatin wa manzili. And the poet of Jahiliya, speaking about the house of the beloved crying over the house of the beloved, yearning just to see, to feel the house of the beloved. Of the house of the beloved is the house of Khalid bin Zayd Abu Ayyub al-Ansari rahimahullah ta'ala. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said, you don't even understand this reality. You know, you know, if you understood, you would tell me like, yeah, move up a little bit, let me sort of join you on top of the grave. Huh? That's the shatin of the muhib, not way haka. Huh? 
And so here, Sahaba, first generation, up until our generation of, in this age of ours, beautiful age, from the beautiful gifts we've been given, is preservation of these great realities that relate to the Prophet ﷺ in every shape and form. You want to see his burda? His burda still remains. Multiple burdas. Because, you know, when people get on to the great woman, I mean, mean, all you've got to do, if you can't get his garment, make him a garment and take it back from him, lo and behold, garments upon garments upon garments. You know what I mean? Then he say, Allah Ta'ala says, above everyone of knowledge is somebody of more knowledge. I mean, you clever. Yani, but others are more clever than you, my dear woman. And in the tradition of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he goes on to this woman, the woman we mentioned about, and he says to the woman, he says, I hear that you have a garment that the Prophet Sallallahu wore. And she says, indeed. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf says, will you just let me wear it? And she goes, of course. And so she gives it to Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, the great companions of the ten who's guaranteed paradise. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf wears the garment that the Prophet Sallallahu wore. And then she says, like she said to the Rasul, I said, you can wear it, but you can't keep it. Give me my garment back. And so she, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, radiallahu anhu, warda, lahda, yani here, radiallahu anhu, ittiba' al-Rasul. Just like the Prophet Sallallahu gave it back, he gives it back. And what we sort of have to sort of, yani, enter into this wonder, wondrous world of the hearts of the companions. Don't think he's just giving the woman back a shirt. Mahu niyatu. What is his intention when he gives the shirt back? Ittiba' al-Rasul. To follow the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa Just as he gave the woman back the shirt, then I make the intention, Ya Allah, no way to. Anu'atiha kama a'ataha Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. wa sallam. And so therefore, it's not just giving a woman back a shirt. Ibadatullah. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in higher degrees. But Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, mashallah, tabarakallah. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, possibly, يعني, one of the richest men ever to walk the earth. يعني, يعني, person of great wealth. He says, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa, wa rda, that I got to a point that I believe if I would just turn over a rock in Medina, I would find gold beneath it. And you'd find more than gold, yeah, Abdul Rahman. You'd find the earth of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Uh, and so that takes intelligence to be that type of man. When he died, radiallahu anhu wa rda, they had to bring, you know, monies minted, minted, coins that came from Rome, Busra, northern um, Arabian territory. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, when he died, they had to bring axes for his money, axes. He just had blocks of gold, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa rda, blocks of it. Bullion, radiallahu anhu wa rda. Some from his intelligence, on his, on his will, what did he place? He placed in his will that I want to be buried in that shirt that that woman <laughs> allowed me to wear. I want to be buried in it. Let's see what she's going to do at that point in time. I mean, she's going to allow me to wear it, but when I'm six feet under the ground, she can't ask, give me it back. Huh? I said, you can wear it, not keep it. And so it came to pass in a riwayah. In another riwayah, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, radiallahu anhu, look at the shan. Yeah, because you ask, why is he guaranteed paradise? And Abu Bakr, why guaranteed paradise? Huh? Tell me. Because why? Because understanding why Abu Bakr's guaranteed paradise will give you a pathway to paradise. What is it? What's the, what, what did he have? Uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, what did he have? Uthman ibn Affan, what did he have? Ali ibn Abi Talib, what did he have? And Talha, Zubair. Tell me what they had. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Sa'id. Tell us what they had. What was the quality that they had? And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shows you Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa rda that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq ma sabaqakum Abu Bakrin bi kathratu salati wa siyami the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says wa sadaqa that Abu Bakr doesn't race ahead of you go ahead of you with a lot of prayer okay doesn't go ahead of you with a war with a lot of fasting or a lot of charity note he has a lot of prayer from the poems of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, who was a poet. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu warda. What is wrong with your eyes? It's as if they have an injury in them. I mean, he doesn't go to sleep at night. This is what's called tajrid. You'll see in the beginning. Imam al-Busayri rahimahullah. Tajarrud. Yujarrid an nafsihi. He goes into a spiritual state, Imam al-Busayri. Like Abu Bakr. Spiritual state where now he's speaking to his own soul. What is wrong with your eyes? That they don't sleep. It's as if they have an injury inside of them. He says, radiallahu anhu wa rda. He had a lot of prayer. Araf. He had a lot of fasting, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And Abu Bakr couldn't keep up his izar. He was so thin, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. He used to eat once every seven, eight days, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Yani, khalas, mashah. 
and his sadaqa, Abu Bakr, yani, tribes Abu Bakr used to what? Maintain with his own wealth. Sadaqa. Yani, Sayyiduna a'taqa Sayyidana, as Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab says. Our master, Abu Bakr, who freed our master, Bilal, radiallahu anhu warda. But that isn't the reason the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. وَلَكِنْ شَيْئًا وَقَّرَ اللَّهُ فِي قَلْبِ أَبِي بَكَرَ But it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cast into the heart of Abu Bakr. What do you think it was that Allah ta'ala cast into the heart of Abu Bakr? What is it inside of the heart of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf that he would want to share it of a woman just to wear it for a moment and to be buried with it? In the other tradition, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, they're in a gathering with the Rasul and then somebody gives the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a shirt, beautiful shirt, brand new shirt. Right there in the gathering of the Rijal, the men of the, and the great women of the companions, radiallahu anhum, wardahum. And both the men and women in a circle all seeking proximity to the Rasul. Of the most, you had A'jab al Ajaib, of the most stranger things we see inside of those circles, you'd even find women. And women who would wear like you know, the burnous, they'd wear like a hood upon their head, cover their faces, and sit right in front of the Rasul so they could get right up close. Nobody knows whether they're men or whether they're women. They just wanted proximity to the Prophet One of the greatest women of Islam ever, her name is Umm Darda. That's what she used to do, Umm Darda. I put a hood upon her head and sit right up to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inside of the circles of men, men to the right, left and behind, where she's up close. That's all she cares about. That's called tunnel vision, eh? Radiallahu ta'ala anha wa arda. So in one of those great circles, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, the Prophet now has a new shirt upon him. And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf in front of the mala says, Ya Rasulullah, please give me that shirt. Give me the shirt. Now we don't get it because the Prophet said, for somebody to speak in his presence is difficult. Huh? It's as if they had beards perched upon their head. Really difficult to speak in the presence of the Prophet. Really difficult. Radiallahu anhum wardahum. And that's why the Rasul himself, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, would often bring it forth from the companions. Look at in the riwayah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, in the mustatrak, saluni, saluni, ask me. And sahaba don't ask. Saluni, he says, ask. They don't ask. Saluni, ask. And he keeps saying, saluni, 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 until the sahaba are all weeping, crying. They can't open their mouth, they're crying. Saluni, ask, ask. And the Sahaba was crying and crying and crying and crying and crying. And the only thing that ultimately prevents the Prophet from continually saying Saluni is Umar ibn Khattab raising his voice. Radina billahi rabba wa bil islami dina wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rasula. We are pleased with God as a Lord and with Islam as a religion and with Muhammad as a messenger. And when the Prophet heard that, sakat, then he, he falls silent sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. So for Abdul Rahman ibn Awf to speak and then to ask. So the Prophet Sallallahu stands up, goes inside of his house, and everyone knows what he's going to do, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He never yani, refuses somebody who asks. And there he comes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in his absence, the Sahaba jump on Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. Jump upon him. Fi Abdul Rahman. How could you dare ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi for the shirt? Ah, how could you ask him for it? And he, and he stopped for a moment, you get into the heart of the companions. Man, because I wanted that shirt, you know what I mean? You said that at me before me, eh? No doubt that's something way, going through the heart of the companions themselves. Eh? And you got their face. But you know that nobody needs it more than him. He needs that shirt. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Rasul. I tell you, you go into his wardrobe, he has no wardrobe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. doesn't have one. As Aisha says, eh? he only has one of every garment, one of it. And if he gives one away, khalas, nothing left, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know that nobody needs that garment more than him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he comes out, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he folds and gives to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. Abdul Rahman's response to the companions, by Allah, the only reason I wanted it was to be buried in it. That's the only reason I wanted it. Only buried in it. How many shirts did Abdul Rahman ibn Awf have of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I mean, subhanAllah, this ummah, the khair of this ummah is in preserving anything that connects to the Prophet Sallallahu Can you imagine, Shof, to this day, yani, um, the ummah has preserved yani, the water that the Prophet Sallallahu was washed in for his ghusl. Seven al the seven wells, the water of the seven wells, preserved, rough. 
I've got myself some. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah, khalas. Umar has preserved it. Shuf. What, what is that? You preserve water that was used to wash the Prophet in his person 1500 years later. Yeah, what, what, what type of nation is that? That's a nation of the Prophet is ummatikal matar. That my nation is like rain. I don't know whether the best of it is in the beginning or at the end. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that type of nation. And what type of nation preserves his hair? Do you know that there are people on this earth today that who have so much hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they sit there and comb it. Comb. Not the great strand, but they have so much, they just, mashallah, grooming the hair of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Show us, what type of nation is that? You see, that's like Aisha, radiallahu anha. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in i'tikaf. He used to sit in the mosque. He's in i'tikaf, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a spiritual retreat inside of the mosque. He would sit with his back to the house of Aisha, and Aisha would be grooming his hair, combing his hair, whilst he's in the mosque. Now, what is that but an expression of love? And what is that if you're able to comb the hair of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the same intention that Aisha had, but an expression of love? And Aisha, radiallahu anha, what was hindi a hair intention? Did the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not used to groom his beautiful and long, um, black, curly hair, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam? Tayyib, inshallah, tabarakallah. Ya Allah, inshallah ta'ala, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to become the beautiful reign of the latter portion of the Umar of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A heart that has the reign of the Rasul, enveloping him, saturating him with love and attachment and connection to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in every single atwa, in every single wa realm of the human being one of our teachers Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad nuri kasari wa madadik al-jari wa jma'ni bihi fi kulli atwari wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ya nur the great sort of ways that we were that we invoke prayers, peace, love Upon the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Allahumma salli wa sallam. Oh Allah, I invoke mercy, love, wa sallam, and peace. Ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Upon our lives, Lord Muhammad. Who is he? Nurika as-sari. He is your flowing light. Wa madaduka jari. And he is your running sustenance. وَجْمَعْنِي بِهِ فِي كُلِّ أَطْوَارِ Gather me with him in every single realm, every dimension, every dimension. Gather me with him upon my tongue. Gather me with him inside of my mind, or up inside of my heart, or inside of my soul, or inside of my secret, or inside of my naps even. As in Tirmidhi, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هوا أن تبع لي ما جدت به. None of you truly believe and perfected faith. He said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, until your hawa, your hawa is what the ego does, is in accordance with what I have brought. And what has he brought? Love of him. Love of him. That's what لا يؤمن أحدكم means. As we know in the Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and others. Love of the Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم. The poets, deviants follow them. Have you not seen how they wander in every valley and how they say that which they do not? Save those who have faith and do good works and remember God much and vindicate themselves that they have been wrong. Okay? And in poetry as a phenomenon, and the Arabs know poetry. And it is the greatest poets that the world has ever known. The Arabs in Jahiliya, pre-Islam, the pre-Islamic era. And in poets to a degree. In any type of poetry, any genre of poetry that you wish to engage, you will find it upon the tongues of those early people. You know, nowadays, you may see inside of sort of inside of the, in the, the vernacular or the culture, you will find people who are lord, people who are good with poetry, like rappers or what have you. And then the most of the ones who they lord the most, exalt the most, are the ones who are able to manifest this spontaneously in what they call freestyle. Eh? When you look at the Arabs themselves, the ancient Arabs, all of their poetry was freestyle. They, they didn't write, the Arabs. And any, po any poem, khalas, had to come spontaneously from their mind, or from their heart, or from their soul, the Arabs themselves. And then when you gaze, those poems that they wrote, yeah, 2,000, 3,000 years later, we're still studying those poems that they wrote. Still studying. 
Yani, yani, gu guaranteed, yani, whatever you like, whatever you want to say, those, yani, guaranteed nobody's going to be studying Jay-Z or Biggie Smalls or Tupac. Yani, in a hundred years' time, they ain't going to be studying them. Uh -huh. Are off, fleeting, comes and goes. Why? Le yen fang. Why? It doesn't benefit. And me me yen fang nas. Fa yam kut filak, as Allah Ta'ala said. As for that which benefits humanity, remains upon the face of the earth. But those early people benefited. Why? Because they took the art to its pinnacle. And many of them, mashallah, tabarakallah, when they're speaking about death, they open you up to the reality of death. When they're speaking about life, yani, they take you to the world of the living. When they're speaking about love, then you become the lover and the beloved in union. Okay? And when they praise, in the medhi, la that's what one of them said from Banu Tamim, of the great poets of Banu Tamim. He said to the Prophet, you know, when I praise, Zain, it's good. Honey, when I praise, ah, but when I when I heap rebuke, when I scorn, when I call you out, I will disfigure you, he says. To the Rasul, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What he trying to say to the Rasul that khalas, that yani, you need me on side. And one of those poets said, you got me on side, all will go good for you in, in Arabia. Look at the Rasul, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Thatkahu Allah. That's God, right? You. That's Allah, subhanahu wa taala. The one who when he praises, la zain, zain, zain is beautiful when he praises, subhanahu wa taala. You beautiful. When in them, Allah taala, when he heaps scorn. The shame, Allah disfigure you, so disfigured you cast you into the abode of disfigurement known as known as his hellfire, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ah, the Arabs, mashallah tabarakallah, and Busayri is in that vein. Say that the poets deviants follow them. Okay. The poets can be deviant. They have so much power over the qulub, over the hearts of human beings. They can, and if they're deviant, they will cause somebody to go into a state of deviancy. Araf. Who, the greatest poet who ever walked the earth. That's what they said. Who is that? Imr Qais, his name is. Imr Qais, the Hadrami poet from Kinda. Uh, and the Prophet said about Imr Qais, Imr Qais, Qa'id al-Shu'ara'i al He's the leader of poets to hell. He will guide and lead all poets to hellfire. The Prophet said about Imr Qais. And why? Where did Imr Qais go wrong? Imr Qais went wrong with content, not with form. Yeah, and you, and you, you, you listen to like, you know, gangster rap or what have you, all that stuff, gangster rap or what have you, Imran Qais took it to a different degree, took it to the pinnacle. You read that, it's like you're listening to modern day gangster rap in terms of content. But in terms of form, he was unparalleled in terms of form, Imran Qais. Uh -huh. Parallels with Imran Qais, we'll see inside the Bible say. So Imran Qais and those who, regardless of your form, if your content ain't beautiful, khalas, into al amar that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deviate you to hell. Huh? Yani, you deal man you share subhanahu wa ta'ala. He allows those to stray whoever he wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you not seen how they wander in every valley? In every single human emotion or any spiritual reality human being has, you'll find the power to beat everybody to it. Express it like nobody else has expressed it. But there's one valley that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned about. Who, what is that? The valley of faith. And the valley of perfection of faith, which lies in the love of the Rasul himself. That's why Busayri has khulud. He's eternal. That's why when you look at the great poets, for us, the greatest poet ever is Um, Hassan ibn Thabit. Sha'ir Rasul, the poet of the Messenger of Allah. The poet. I mean, just to be called the poet, you gotta be something of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, somebody who had over 127 poets, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 127 of them. And from amongst them, Abu Bakr, from amongst them, Umar ibn al-Khattab, from amongst them, the great woman, Aisha, who was the supreme one, as Imam Sa'id ibn Musayyib said, Abu Bakr was a poet, Umar was a poet, but Aisha, she was the expert in poetry. Aisha, radiallahu anha, wardaha. Poets, upon poets he had, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes their genre was kufr, Sometimes their genre was war. I mean, a line of poetry like the great poet Ka'b ibn, Ka ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu wa ra, an entire tribe known as Dos could enter into the fold of Islam. For a line of poetry of Sayyidina Ka'b ibn Malik, 
the power of the poets in that, inside of that day and age. And that's why the Prophet was one of the reasons why he employed them. But the greatest of them was saying of whom? Hassan ibn Thabit. Why? Content. Not form. Content. What was his content? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Okay? Illa alladheena amin. Say those who have faith and do good works. Appropriate word. I mean, maybe they compose good works. You see? In praise of Allah or in praise of his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And remember God much. Uh, and that inshallah ta'ala because what we hope to engender inside of our circle for wherever it's with is people who express their love. Salih, for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they express it and what is, the Ummah has always expressed its love in language for the Messenger of Allah. Why do you think Allah Ta'ala gave you a tongue? Huh? What for? Yeah. To praise the world. That, that is. Allah Ta'ala gave you a tongue. Hmm? Have you ever thought about it? Why did Allah Ta'ala give me a tongue? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, he said, a dunya mal'una wa mal'una ma fiha. The entire world is a curse, and the curse of whatever resides therein. Uh, except dhikr Allah ta'ala. Except the remembrance of God. Allah ta'ala showing you why he gave you a tongue, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why he gave you one tongue. Why he gave you one heart. And that one tongue and one heart should be in unison for the one, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one who's at one with the one. In Allah Ta'ala, wit you hebbal watar, as the Zaruk Rahimullah Ta'ala says. Verily, God is one and He loves those who are at one with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet said. Okay, so the poets are important, and Busayri is going to travel the path of the ancient poets. But the ancient ones in a good sense, ancient in good form, mashallah, but also ancient in good wa, in good function, good meaning. And that good meaning is about His love of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi you're ill, okay? You're ill. Tired. You're sick. Maybe it's you're chronically ill. Sick. What would you do? You're chronically ill. Ah. Situation of Abu Sayyid, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he has paralysis. He's paralyzed on one side. Paralyzed, completely paralyzed. Like a stroke. What would you do if you had a stroke? Abu Sayyid understands to do, I'm going to compose a poem. In praise of the Prophet perhaps by virtue of that, I will re I will achieve shifa wa shafa. Uh, I will attain healing as well as intercession of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi And what type of heart did Busayri have? Such that when he composes that poem, uh, he goes to sleep inside of the dream state, and there he sees the Prophet sallallahu in front of him. And then he recites the entire poem in his dream state. And it, what is that? And it, that's connection, huh? Then the dream world is a good way to indicate where your connections lie. And in some of us, it's like, yeah, it, it's football repeated inside of our dream state. Or music repeated, or films repeated. Uh, inside of our dream state, it shows us where we connect to inside of the wake state. But Abu Sayyid Rahimullah Ta'ala is... Dream state indicates that the wake state is connection to the Messenger of Allah. And he has full recollection, total recall of his own in the dream state. And he recites it to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in entirety. And then the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he is nailed, here's his attainment, takes off his cloak, and he wraps Busayri inside of his cloak, inside of the dream state. Busayri wakes up, khalas, the paralysis has been lifted. What is that, Yani? What do you think of what is that? Because maybe one of us, we have an illness, so then we compose a poem, and then in the dream state, we have total recall, mashallah, tabarakallah, and maybe even we have the messenger of Allah, so the same side of the dream state, but then when we wake up, we're still sick as hell. And it shows us that there's a ruh, there is a spirit that is missing inside of our heart. The heart doesn't infuse our words with the spirit. Our dream, although the Prophet Sallallahu comes in the dream state, often he comes to show us our deficiencies, our distance from him, often why he comes. That's why when we see him inside the dream state, we don't see him kemahu, as he was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but we see him as we perceive him to be. And he ain't interested in your perception, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he's interested because your perception is faulty, it's flawed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
But his visit is a way of healing, of showing you your deficiency so that you draw close. And you leave all of that stuff behind and enter into the beautiful world that is called Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. And he wakes up and he's healed. And then Allah Prophet sends next man to him. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. Who says, where's that poem that you have? He says, what poem? He said, you know the poem that you composed for the messenger of Allah? Who said, it's like strange. I never told anybody about that poem. Huh? He said, how do you know about that poem? He said, because I heard the poem being recited to the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu last night. Uh, I was in the majlis. Okay, give me the poem. And then he gives the poem over to the man because he said, at that point I realized this poem, Lahu Shatin, it has an affair, has a big affair in this poem. I mean, how right was it? Because you can say, oh, who does he think he is? And everybody who sort of composes a nice piece of work, yeah, he's going to say, yeah, nah, this has an affair in this poem. Everyone's going to say that. But I guess sort of 800 years later, we can say, Bosaini was right, huh? In the city of the caves, how <laughs> we can be reciting Bosaini's poem. I mean, sure, reciting Bosaini's poem, how many understood what was being recited? We don't, even, we don't even understand the words, but we still sing the words. You know, like back in the day when you used to sort of, um, or maybe in the day, maybe today, maybe, when you're watching like the Eurovision Song Contest or what have you, and they're singing in all them funny languages, yeah, you just turn it off, huh? Can't understand what they're saying. But why is it that you can listen to Busseri over and over and over again and you don't understand what he's saying? What about if I took out the diwan of, of Sayyidina Hum, Sayyidina Ka'ab ibn Zuhair, or Ka'ab ibn Malik, or Abdullah ibn Rawaha, the poets of the Rasul. Look at the Rasul to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Ya Abdullah, ma huwa shi'ar. Abdullah, what is poetry? Abdullah ibn Rawaha says to the Prophet it's something yakhtalij that intermingles in my very soul that manifests upon my tongue, O oh Messenger of Allah. I mean, that's what poetry is. Huh? It intermingles in the depths of my soul, the manifest of my tongue. That's Abdullah ibn Rawaha, radiallahu anhu, and that's poetry. He's telling the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Hassan ibn Thabit, the poets. Huh? Years later to be remembered, mashallah, tabarakallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places us inside of their great company, inshallah, tabarakallah. Look at Umar, the best craft of man or lines of poetry that he performs, detailing his needs. Through it sowing affection in the heart of his beloved and through it turning the heart of one wretched. Uh, the best craft of man are lines of poetry. I mean, that is mashallah for the poet. When so the likes of Umar ibn Khattab is showing you its darat, its degree. Umar lay on tip, it's not of his own desire, his own perspective. That's something he took from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, the masjid of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is a quote unquote, mimba. This could be translated as throne or pulpit, whatever you want to translate it, that has been placed there just for Hassan to stand upon and recite poetry. In the mosque of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi any mosque that we have that doesn't have some type of facility for poets to manifest praise of the Prophet Sallallahu that mosque is deficient, disconnected from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Because it's that pulpit and Hassan above it, that's what brings Gabriel, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, recite, O Hassan, wa ruhul qudus ma'ak, and the Holy Ghost, as the Christians have it. Gabriel is alongside you when you're recited, inside of the masjid of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam. So the best craft of man are lines of poetry. Sure, which one of us has ever wanted to be a poet? For real. People want to be doctors, people want to be lawyers, people want to be dentists, and then people want to be footballers. And then you kick a ball, you know, that's what you want to do for the rest of your kick a ball. But which one of us ever wanted to be a poet? Where we could express our love for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's Hassan bin Thabit, that's all he has. Yo Muqiyama, Mada indaka ya Hassan. What is it that you have? I just have poetry. Hassan. Araft. Look at him in the process and places him inside of the inside of the fortress. Guarded women, saying Hassan ibn Thabit. He has to guard the women at, at the Battle of Khandaq. And then one of the enemy combatants, eh, he gets up, he gets, he comes out of the fortress. He wants to sort of now get into, into the fortress where the women and the children are. And Hassan ibn Thabit. Araf. Sophia bint, Ab bint Abdul Muttalib. Sophia, the aunt of the Prophet, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. She says to Hassan, look, enemy combatant. Hassan, yeah, do what the Messenger of Allah has sent you to do. 
Hassan looks over and says, Whoa, you know, I'm a poet, not a warrior. <laughs> you know me? I, 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 my, my craft is poetry. Ah, that's Hassan. And that Sophia, like, give me that. She just takes the sword. His sword. Just takes the sword of Hassan, puts the, pu pushes the man aside, goes beyond the fortress. Look at the great woman. And slays the enemy combatant. I'll do it. I ask you just keep reciting your poetry. And he, that's Hassan, that's all he had. Look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Banu Tamim come unto him. Yeah, we want a poet, we want poetry and prose. Yeah, it's like the, the battle's on. That's how Banu Tamim come. They're shouting outside of the house of the Rasul. That's Surat al Hujarat. From outside of the house of the Rasul, they're shouting, Out, out! It's on! The battle's on! It's language now. That's how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes out, Mesha walks past them. Walks past them, battles on, a battle. <laughs> and the bottom goes, you suddenly praise. So they stand in the masjid, and thereafter they say, yeah, it's on, it's on. Tamim saying it's on. And so the Prophet Sallallahu says, call Thabit ibn, ibn Qais, Ibn Shamas Ibn Qais. Call Thabit. So they call Thabit, and they stand upon the member of the Rasul Banu Tamim. So they begin to speak in prose. Thabit stands. On the member of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam begins to speak in prose. Look at them. I can get all language. You got it, yeah. You got it. Banu uh, Tumim says, he's got it, he's got it, yeah. He's the better. Then the Prophet said, he said, poetry now. Now it's poetry. This is the crown of it. Poetry. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, go and bring Hassan ibn Thabit. So they go to the house of Hassan ibn Thabit and they say to Hassan, oh Hassan, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants you to recite poetry. So Hassan starts reciting poetry. He said, Hassan, not here. <laughs> in the mosque. Yeah, he get to the mosque to recite poetry. And so Hassan goes to the message of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa and there it's on with Banu Tamim. So Banu Tamim take to the member and they start reciting poetry. And then the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, commands Sayyidina Hassan ibn Thabit. He takes to the member and starts reciting poetry. Uh, what ensues? Banu Tamim says, you've got it. the entire tribe enters into the fold of Islam. Now, can you understand that? And from poetry and prose, an entire tribe entered into the fold of Islam. Do you understand that? So the best craft of man are lines of poetry that he performs, detailing his needs. Through it, sowing affection in the heart of his beloved, and through it, in the heart of the one wretched. You could even transform those who are wretched for that which is better. Huh? Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu wa ta'ala. Tayyib, inshaAllah ta'ala, introduction, inshaAllah ta'ala. We'll look at some of the words of Al-Busayri, rahimahullah ta'ala, and we'll try to explain the initial chapter. He says, رضي الله تعالى عنه وارضاء من تذكر جيران بذي سلمي مزلش دمعا جرى من مقلة بدمي He says, is it from remembering past neighbors at Dhu Salam that you mingle with blood, tears shed from your eyes? Is it from remembering past neighbors at Dhu Salam that you mingle with blood, tears shed from your eyes? Okay? Here of the first things that the Imam anhu introduces us to is what we described before as his Tawr. On the Tawr are the different degrees of man. Okay? Like the human being is a very complex creature. And it's complex to, to the point that the entire cosmos is inside of man. Complex. So there's nothing that exists without, save that it exists also within inside of the human being. And for amongst them are these sort of senses that we have, the human being is complexity, we have different types of senses. Maybe in English we speak about five senses. Yeah, in, in Islam we speak about ten senses. We have external senses and we also have internal senses also. For amongst the internal senses, what Imam Busayri here employs, which is called tadhakkur. It's called your dhuk. Dhuk. Okay? Different from dhikr. A dhikr bin lisan was dhukr bil qalb. And the dhikr is something that is done with the tongue, whereas the vuk is something that is done with the heart. And it's not fikr. Different. Right? Different capacity or internal sense of the human being. As so Imam Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala wants to now see the reality of somebody's dhukr, which is the sense of remembrance that the human being has. Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala, as we alluded to before, he has something what's called tajreed. And it tajreed. And it, what is Tijreed? Tijreed is one of the realities of Nabuwa or prophecy. It's when, it's what we may call in English, like an out-of-body experience. That's what we call it in English, an out-of-body experience. It's when your soul jurrid min al when the soul is stripped from the body. Okay? 
and you're still living. Normally when the soul departs from the body, you call that one of two things. You call it sleep or you call it death. Sleep or death. Sleep when there's a temporal separation. Death when it's permanent. And that's the secret of why the Prophet ﷺ said, a noam ukhayyil mawt. That sleep is the little brother of death or the endeared brother of death, the Prophet ﷺ said. Why? Because they both relate to the separation of body and soul. Sallallahu Alaihi But likewise, by extension, higher beings. And higher beings doesn't necessarily here mean in the sort of spiritual, religious sense. It could also be that they have a higher sensitivity of their soul, what they call khifat al ruh. And Allah Ta'ala can give that to whomever he wants, regardless of faith, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's called khifat al ruh. Where somebody has the ability now to strip their body or their soul from their body. So the Imams radiallahu anhum wardam, more often than not, who are higher spiritual realities, but in the good sense, they have this phenomenon. And what I'm trying to sort of you know, make sure that you understand is don't think that this is something in the imagination of Al Busayri, rahimahullah ta'ala. Don't think that was taking place. Like oh, Imam al Shafi'i radiallahu anhu wardam, in his great work, the Risala, when he has Tajreed. Don't think that this is something that's in the imagination of a Shafi'i. Yeah, he's creating this imaginary second person, imaginary second person, through which he's going to hold a conversation with. And for many of us, the way to sort of train the soul for that is to have an imaginary second person. Ah, to have that. To, yeah, to undergo the actual process of speaking to this imaginary second person about issues that relate to yourself. Ah, rough. But that imaginary second person being quote unquote the reality of your own nafs, your lower nafs. Everyone know your nafs, your ego, a reality that Allah Ta'ala has created inside you. And everything that you do wrong is by virtue of that. In the nafs Allah Amara Bisu. Then the nafs, the self, it commands the evil. Allah Ta'ala says inside of the Quran. One of the ways it's read, and the primary way it's read, is when you hold a conversation with it. Day after day, night after night, week after week, month after month, year after year, till it's settled, till it's disciplined. It's, as you say, under manners. You've got it under manners, the nafs. But in the beginning, yeah, you ain't got real contact with your nafs. You ain't got that. You're not spiritual enough. But, yeah, in lam takun mithlahum, finna tashabbah bil kirami falahu. One of them said, yeah, and imitate if you're not from amongst them. Because imitation is still success. I mean, just to pretend is still success. I mean, right now we're all pretending to be religious. Many of us pretending to be religious. It's a pretense. And we've got to pretend and pretend and pretend till Allah Ta'ala makes it real. And makes us real folk, real people. Minhu, that's from him. Pretense is from us, reality is from God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ah. And so here, these are the imams of reality. Ahlul Haq, they call them. Don't think this is pretense. This is tajreed here. And now there's a conversation with his own reality. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ah, so It's irf from the Rasul. Ibn, Ibn Khaldun in his muqaddimah, he said that the Prophet وسلم, the highest form of revelation is when the Prophet وسلم, engages Gabriel in the world of Gabriel. Not Gabriel metamorphosizes into man, but the Prophet وسلم, quote unquote, metamorphosizes into angel. And then when you see that, the Sahaba, when they saw it, then they would take the rida, the cloak of the Rasul, and they would place it over his head. And you see the Prophet shaking, shaking, shaking beneath it. That's all they would see, just cover him, cover the Rasul. And they'd all step back and just watch until they see his body still. When his body still, they remove the covering, and then the Prophet speaks about that which what came forth from Gabriel alayhi salam. So this is this inheritance from our Imams in that regard. And so what is he addressing himself with? Because he's looking at the state of what? Of his heart and his soul and his body as it relates to the object of his love. And this is sort of traditional poetry of the Arabs here, what he employs. It's called Naseeb. The Arabs call it Naseeb. In the beginning of their poetry, they're going to speak about this sort of loved one. Maybe it's, it's imaginary, maybe for the Arabs, maybe. Some of them, when they enter the fold of Islam, it becomes real under the tarbiyah of the Rasul. So you see Imr al-Qais, as we said, yani, yani, Kifa, stand up, Nebki, let us all cry, Min Vikra Habibate, through making mention of our beloved Wa Menzili and her house. 
or Ka'b ibn Zuhair radiallahu anhu when he stands in front of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and when the great Imam al, Imam al Bujairi rahimahullah ta'ala al Bujairi he says that this is not the Burda he said the, the work of Busairi should not be called the Burda but he said the work of Busairi should be called the Shifa it should be called the healing he said okay even Busairi didn't call it the Burda people started calling it the Burda and he said oh you mean my poem yeah, Bujairi says it should be called the healing he said, as for the Burda, it's the, it's the poem of Ka'ab ibn Zuhair, the great companion. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. And the companion who had a brother, his father was very famous, very famous poem, poet. His father's name was Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma. Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma. He's considered the seven greatest poets ever. What's called Ashab al Ma'allaqat. Those who could freestyle poetry, and their poetry was so good amongst poets and people of language that they would take the entire poem, write it in gold, ink, and hang it upon the Kaaba. That's what's called the, the Mu'allaqat, the Sabah, the seven suspended oaths, seven supreme poets of Arabia. But amongst them, Zuhayb and Abi Sulma, he sees a beautiful dream. In the dream, he sees a ladder coming out of the sky. Zuhayb sees a ladder coming out of the sky, and he sees himself ascending in the heavens towards the ladder. And just as he's about to grab hold of the first rung of the ladder, he wakes up out of his dream, Zuhayb and Abi Sulma. And so his sons and his family ask, what was the dream? What did the dream mean? A will who? He said, the dream, the ladder coming out of the sky was a ladder of prophecy. And that wrong was the last prophet. And my inability to grab it means I'm not going to live to meet the prophet. I mean, look, look at what type of spirit is that? You're able to interpret a dream like that. And so he says to his sons, he said, if you meet him, if you live to meet him, believe in him. Make sure you believe in him. That's Zuhayr Abi Sulma is the greatest of the, of the Jahiliya poets from the perspective of content. That's why we looked at Umar ibn al-Khattab, the best craft of a man alliance of poetry. Umar ibn al-Khattab used to say, La ufaddil ala ahad. I don't prefer anybody over sahib men, wa men, wa men, over the author of men, wa men, wa men, the famous po poet of, of Zuhayr ibn Abi Sulma. Huh? Look at the statement he said in Jahiliya. Whatever character trait that a human being possesses, even if he tries to hide it from people, the day will come when it will manifest. Has to. Huh? That's why the Prophet وسلم, even at the last moment, in the one of these will act the action of the people of paradise. As it appears to people. But what's really inside of your soul? Last moment, there are, it comes out, the Prophet said. Your foulness, your wickedness, even at the last moment, may it be. One of these will act the action of the people of hell. In their entire life, you think these people are disbelievers, kuffar, or whatever you want to call them. Last moment, no, there's something in the midst of their soul. Last moment, God decrees for it to flower, to manifest, to beautify the universe. He said in Bukhari and Muslim, and thereby they act the action of the people of paradise and the end of the people of paradise. That's Zuhair. That's the father. Umar said, we don't prefer anybody over him. He's the supreme poet. Why? Because it's all ethics. Nothing foul about Zuhair inside of his great Mu'allaqa. So he has two sons. One's called Ka'ab and one's called Bujair. And then the Prophet Sartam appears. Summons eh, to prophecy and to one God deity to Makalim al Akhlaq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Bujair, he says, Uthbut ma'al ghalam, you stay here with the sheep. This man who's claiming he's the prophet, is this the one our father was speaking about? And so he goes to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He just tells his brother, You wait here, I'm going to go check it out and I'm coming back to see you. <laughs> and he goes, he goes there to what? To see the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He ain't going back nowhere, young man. And he says, Khalas, I'm with the Rasul connected. I ain't even going back to my brother. I mean, can you, I mean, you try and figure that out. That's your brother, go and call him. Pops told you to call him as well, Yani. But you left your brother with sheep. That's where you've left him. Zuhay and Bujay. And then he just writes a letter. That's all he does. You know, those who can write, writes a letter, Khalas, sends it to Ka'ab, telling Ka'ab, Khalas, this is the one. This is the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ka'ab, when he received the letter, vexed, 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 yeah. what's just going on here, yeah. and so he, he then responds in poetry, they're writing to each other in poetry, he has this long poem, he recites about, about, about um, um, Bujayb, 
يعني will anybody convey my letter to Bujair? Hallaka fima quta laka hallaka. And it's like, look at that language. And if you understand Arabic, hallaka fima quta laka hallaka. And you see that same language, you see it similar in the, in the, in the Quran. As Allah was saying, Zul al-Qiyamah. Yani similar language, Allah Ta'ala yani speaking in the, in, in the language of whom? Of, of Ka'ab, Ibn Zuhair. So he's saying, will anybody convey to my brother Bujair this letter? Hallaka, <laughs> woe to you, fima quta, in that which you have said. Hallaka, <laughs> hallaka means woe to you, may you be destroyed. Is this yours? It means so many things at the same time. The power of his language. Yani. Yani, yani, omni meaning that it has. And what is it that he said? La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Oh, what are you going on with? He's saying, he's saying to him in our language. And he says, Hella kafiba quta la ka hella ka. And he says, Sakaka bi hella ma'munu ka isan rawiyata. He says, The ma'moon, the Prophet is called the ma'moon, the trustworthy one. Sakaka, he's just intoxicated you. And he's drugged you, intoxicated you. Rendered you intoxicated, drunk. What does Bujair do? Look, this is love, yani. Bujair goes straight to the Rasul and recites the entire poem of his brother. Yani, how would you do that? Because your brother's got me in trouble, yeah. And the Prophet listens to the poem, and then when it gets to the Sakaka bihal Ma'moon, that the Ma'moon, the Ma'moon means a trustworthy one. Yani, you're calling the Prophet وسلم, a magician, but he's the trustworthy one. And the paradox, huh? The irony. And if Hassan hears the words Al Ma'moon, then he stops him and he says, Al Ma'moon, wallah. Yes, I am the trustworthy one. By God, I'm the trustworthy one. Then he says, Man laqa Ka'ab ibn Zuhair. In front of his brother, whoever meets Ka'ab ibn Zuhair, faqtulhu. Kill him. That's what the Rasul says. And you, 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 you speak about me there? <laughs> and me? Araf. And kill him, whoever finds him. So then the tradition that Ka'ab ibn Zuhair khalas, runs for dear life until he gets news that the Prophet وسلم, of who he is. What is that? It's like saying uh, um, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Tirmidhi says that whoever met the Prophet وسلم, yani, uh, at a distance, suddenly, ahaba, you would fear him, abhor of him. But when you drew close to him out of knowledge of him, you'd fall in love with him. So Kaab realizes, I just got to get inside of his sphere, his sphere. If I get close to him, then it's all good. It's going to be an issue of love then. From me to him and back again. So he goes to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mulathem. Mulathem, يعني, he's got his turban on, he's like that, disguised. Balaklava, he's ballied up as we'd say in Liverpool. He's got a bali on, يعني. And so he goes up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like that, يعني. If Ka'ab ibn Zuhair comes to you, Ta'iban, if he comes to you seeking what? Tawbah, will you forgive him for what he said? And the Prophet says, I'll forgive him. I forgive everyone. And, yeah. and, yeah. As we hear, I've been sent, Bidina Samha. I've been sent with the forgiving way, the clement way, the way of love, as the Prophet says in another one says. So Ka'ab ibn Zuhair says, I'm Ka'ab. <laughs> and the Prophet, oh yeah, really, yeah, you're Ka'ab. Uh, and so at that point in time, Ka'ab, look, look, this is a method of Nabuwa. Ka'ab says to Abu Bakr, Yeah, Abu Bakr, and shit. Abu Bakr, poetry, time to celebrate. You, a poet, recite some poetry. He says to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, you sit next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Bakr al-Anhu says, Ala ubalig anni bujayran risalatan fahallaka fi ma quta laka hallaka saqaqi biha al-ma'moon ka'san rawiyatan. He starts to recite the poem that got Ka'ab in trouble. <laughs> look, Abu Bakr. Yani Abu Bakr is like, look, he's the Rasul, he can forgive you. I ain't forgiving nobody for that, Yani. That's Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu wa radu siddiq. Ka'ab says, no, 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 no. Abu Bakr, you got it wrong. Don't go like that. You didn't get my poem right. I said, Saqaqa biha siddiq. You're the magician. You're the one who drugged everybody. You're the one who drugged my brother. It's you, he says to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So the Ansar now jump up and they all unsheathe their swords. The Ansar who were there in the majlis. And the Ansar like, we're going to strike his neck. And then the Ka'ab said, you strike my neck? I mean, look at, look at him. You strike my neck? Yani. So Ka'ab starts, I'm going to strike your neck with my tongue. Starts just reciting poems, poems, poems against the Ansar. Yani, why would he do that? 
go against Abu Bakr Siddiq, go against Ansar. Why? Because it's like love from me to him and back again. Eh? I'm protected. You don't see I'm protected. <laughs> I, the Rasul I'm inside of his sphere, I'm up close. You ain't doing nothing to me. That's uh, so what he's saying to, what, to, to the Ansar. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emotions to the Ansar. And he said, sit, sit, sit. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yeah, Ka'ab, why don't you speak good about the Ansar? We use that gift for good. And so Ka'ab then p composes poems, freestyle about the Ansar, praising the Ansar. And the Ansar, you can imagine them. Oh, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Resheathing the sword and sitting back like, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Then he turns towards the Rasul. And that's it. This is Nasir. And that's when he, he composes his 60 lines, 59 lines, right there off his head, on, about the Prophet Sallallahu famous um, poem, 60 line poem of Ka'ab ibn Zuhair, which is the Burda. Huh? And Banat Su'ad. What Banat? That's Tajreeb. Su'ad now has become distinct. Su'ad has appeared right in front of me. And my heart now is like beating. Beating out of intense love for Su'ad. Su'ad is this sort of imaginary second person, quote unquote, for saying Ka'ab ibn Zuhair, until he reveals for all to see who Su'ad is. And that's in his line when he says, Inna Rasula la Saifun bihi. The messenger is the sword through whom or from whom we seek light. Muhammadun min Siyufillahi Maslulu, that he is the best of all swords on she. He says to the Prophet Sallallahu And so the Prophet at that point stands up وسلم, and he takes off his burda and then he just wraps, garbs Ka'ab ibn Zuhair inside of his burda That's the burda. And that's what Bujairi was saying. That poem is the burda. This is the shifa. He's saying radiallahu anhu warda. And that poem became mashallah tabarakallah. I mean, that, 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 the burda, that burda, that specific burda, you see it manifest in the hands of various people. Mu'awi ibn Abi Sufyan is in, in Ka'ab's hands. Then Ka'ab gives it to his children on his death from their inheritance, they keep it. Then Mu'awi ibn Abi Sufyan, the sixth caliph of Islam, he buys it of the children of what? Of, um, of Ka'ab. Buys of the children, some say 25,000 gold coins, some say over 100,000 gold coins, Mu'awiyah pays, just for the burden of the Rasul. Then that burda stays in the hands of Banu Umayyah, remains in the hands of every single caliph. No caliph stands in official, in official office, say that he's wearing the burden of the Rasul from Banu Umayyah. Huh? I mean, ajib for the Umayyads to want to attach the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that way. I mean, ajib. And of the most ajaib is that they say that that burda, yani if anyone's seen, seen it, they've seen it, they say that burda is in the hands of whom now? Mullah Umar of the Taliban. That Mullah Umar of the Taliban, he has the burda of the Rasul. They've seen, I've seen the action where he gets up and he takes the burda and he wears the place of the burda. Mullah Umar. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Ah. I'm into that Kurdish Iran with these salami. I'm into that Shudam and Jaram and Mukhtarim bidami. Inshallah, Taala, we're going to sort of continue with this sort of phase fossil. So we take that as introduction. If anyone has any question, I believe we have sort of 15 or 18 minutes left. Inshallah, Tabarakallah, we can take questions from the session. Inshallah. Uh, now. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi you mentioned the beginning of the call. Um, how it was that Abu Bakr Sadiq excelled um, other people? And I wasn't quite sure how it was that he um, um, included that statement. Yeah, I mean, Abu Bakr excelled due to the intensity of his love for the Prophet. So, not in the, in, in the quantity of Salah or the. No, nope. but the, the, the quantity of, or the intensity of his love will bring the quantity of external deeds. But the thing that God casts into the heart of Abu Bakr is Siddiq is Ruh al Qawl, is, is love and attachment to the Prophet. He had that over and above all companions. Right? No. Well, yeah, come on, Questions, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to say, 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 I'
Zuhair ibn, um, Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma. Ibn Abi Sulma. Um, what is his status within uh, the context? Is he uh, one of those who mentioned the Rahul like the Fatra or like the, uh, those that uh, uh, the Hadith, for instance, is the pre Islamic and that they're not accountable? Uh, uh, yani Zuhair Nabi Sulma, yani his interpretation of the dream came to pass in two ways. One, the manifestation of the final prophet, but on the eve of the manifestation of the final prophet, literally manifest in the age of his children. And number two is that he's not going to live to meet the final prophet. So he dies in what we know as the, is what, what is known in theology as the Fetra. And the Fetra is during this period of cessation between prophets. So it was, it was the longest period of cessation, which is between Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam, and our Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah, yeah. Our ulama have it as 500 years, or the Western society has it at approximately 600 years. Okay, cessation. Anybody who dies inside of that period of time, then they're considered from the people of Fetra. And the position of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, in particular the school of Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, is that they're Najun, is that they're people of paradise. They all go to paradise. Regardless, regardless, yeah, regardless of the fact that they worship idols or what have you, doesn't matter. Why? Because there's no scales of the law. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, we do not punish a nation until we first send a messenger unto them. So Zuhayr Nabi Sulman is from those. Okay? Exceptions to the rule come upon the tongue of the Prophet himself. So there are the same people who the Prophet, although they're from Ahl al Fetra, that the Prophet says they're in hellfire. And the ulama, we don't know why. He says from Nur and Nabuwa. From amongst them, we refer to Imam al-Qais. So Imam al-Qais, the greatest poet. Imam al-Qais is from Ahl al-Fatra. Yet the Prophet is a qaid al-Shu'ara. He's the leader of all poets to hell. Why? We don't know. Speculation, maybe the content of his poetry, some of the ulama say. But you cannot say that definitively. Why? Because there were other poets who were likewise far. Okay? And the same has not been said about them. Yeah. And just how were the companions? Just how the companions can run for the clothing of the Prophet Sallallahu Can we do that with our shirts? Should we not to have things that they have touched? Any yani, uh, imams have spoken in, in that regard, uh, yani, and so in, in short, the answer is yes. Okay, in short, the answer is yes. Yeah, but in, in sort of a more lengthy answer, I don't know, lengthy implication, is the reason why you sort of you would take the shirt, the shirt of your shaykh is by virtue of its connection to the Prophet uh, by virtue of that. And it's for you, it's the sort of next best thing, the next best thing, okay? That, that's the connection of it. Any questions? Inshallah, to why come in. Um, um, none of the poets of the past, the former poets of the past, would have um, forced them up their poetry and constructed it in such a way that more contemporary poets might have it all freestyle. Yep, it was all yeah. freestyle. That's pretty impressive. I know, it's very, it's very impressive. <laughs> I'm impressed, personally. Uh, I was wondering if Shakespeare is anyway near to that level. <laughs> Shakespeare was the poet. <laughs> but, Annie, I don't think he's at that level. And what you'll see even with Shakespeare, no doubt, is that he's influenced because remember they preceded, long preceded Shakespeare. And no doubt in Shakespeare's work, in form as well as in content, you see the influence that comes out of the winds of Arabia, yeah, stayed from the winds of Arabia. 
I mean, Shakespeare's most famous work, Romeo and Juliet. I mean, that is, that's straight Islamic, yani. Layla was Majnoon from the Nej, from Banu Uthra, others likewise. Yani. So you see a lot of the content that Shakespeare is going to draw upon, yani. generically, it comes out of the, the, um, the Muslim world and the Islamic tradition. That's no doubt whatsoever. So the point that the speculation is that he's not Shakespeare, but he's Sheikh Zubair. <laughs> For real, some people say that. That he actually was a Muslim, eh? that Shakespeare, because they don't even know who he is and they don't really know for certain who that Shakespeare individual was. Okay. Oh, no, <laughs> uh, what do I have to do to get from? I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. The difference of the soul and the nafs. And Imam al-Busayri, Rahimullah, it's going to be just discoursing like the second fossil, the second reading, when he begins to open up the discussion of the nafs. And essentially, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates this secret, uh, which Allah ta'ala calls the ruh, calls it the, he calls it ruhi. Although the way the ulama have understood it is that there's a secret, which is the, the secret that is inside of the human being. And that secret that it manifests in varying ways. So we could mention sort of four primary ways that it manifests. So one thing we know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's world, for example, is that the world is a world of spirit as well as a physical, it's a metaphysical world and a, and a physical world. So when the spirit of man, that spirit of man, or that secret of man, better to use that term. The secret of man, when it manifests in the world of spirit, you call that ruh. Ruh. Okay? You don't got it? Yeah. Right. That's why you remember, um, 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 yeah, tell you. you call that ruh. So when the secret of man manifests in the spiritual world, then you call that the ruh. Okay, that's why Allah Ta'ala in the Quran, when He says, an ruh, that they ask you about the ruh. Qul ruh min amri rabbi. Say that the ruh is from Amr Rabbi. It's from, it's from the Amar of my Lord. What does Amar mean? Amar means the world of what? Of metaphysics, the metaphysical realm. As Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Lahul Khalqu wal Amar. To God belongs the Khalq and the Amar. And these are the two polar opposite worlds that God created the universe in. And the Khalq is the world of dimension, space, time, 13, 14, whatever dimensions are on at this point in time in science. And the Amar is its polar opposite. The world of no space, no time, no dimension whatsoever. And the soul is from that latter world, spirit. The second is we have a world in terms of the human being, we have a world of emotions. Okay, and so love is from the world of emotions, like hate is from the world of emotions. When that secret manifests inside of that world, you call it heart, qalb. qalb. That's what it's called in the Quran. So it's a secret manifesting inside of the world of emotions. When it manifests inside of the world of intelligibility, things that are intelligible, what they call ma'apulat, that's aql, intellect, mind, okay? But when it manifests inside of the world of passions and desire, that's what you call nafs, okay? So everyone got this? So nafs is the secret of the human being manifesting inside of the world of what's called mushtahayat, of things that are considered desirable or the object of one's passion. But when it manifests inside the world of spirit, then it's something different, it's called ruh. And both have their, their, their laws. And obviously the ultimate um, reality, uh, the ultimate objective of the human being is what is to be one with God. Is that all of those atwar, all of those dimensions, that they're muwahhid. That's the muwahhid. They become one and render just for the one, okay? And that's what tarbiyah is about. <coughs> Is that okay, sister? Is that the, is that the answer to the question? No. 
There are certain people who say Qasira Burda is bid'ah and shirk. Can you shed some light on this matter? Fasalahu dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. Yani ask the people who know you don't know. And they go and ask them. They're the ones who say that shirk and bid'ah. Ah, subhanallah. Ah, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what I'll say with that. There are certain people who say, yani, Raft, and I'm not sort of yani, trying to demean anybody or the way they see the world, but yani, you know, you can go to sort of um, like a mental asylum, and there's a man, he's standing on a table with his underpants at his ankles, and he's saying, I am Jesus. Now, we, you ain't going to come out and say, you know, in a, in a mental asylum, there's a man, and I saw him, and he had his underpants at his ankle, and he was saying, I am Jesus. But I, you don't give no credibility to him. No credibility. Because you understand the context in which he's in. Are off. Now, you know, you know, when people start uttering, like, you know, what's the point? If someone comes up to you and says, I am Jesus, you're like, <laughs> oh, that's what you're like. And you're not engaging him in anything. I mean, there are certain, like, trigger words that let you know that somebody's a bit sort of Looney Tunes. These are trigger words in our day and age. When you hear someone say shirk, bid'ah, you go. <laughs> That's it. Yani, salam, as Allah Ta'ala said. Just say salam to them. Mesha, walk. Yani, Allah Ta'ala, for the life of me, I don't even know why such people are given any type of credibility. There's no conversation with them in that sense. No, if, if people want to have a conversation about religion, marhaba. But if you're going to start using, you know what I mean? And literally, in English, four letter swear words, shirk bidar, like four letter swear words, and no conversation. Sorry there. And this is ilm, yani. What I mean is ilm, the ulama don't have a conversation with such people. Okay? And here in, in the land known as the land of the angels, England, in this land, yani, khalas, we're distant from the reality of Islam, distant. We're distant in terms of geography, we're distant in terms of topography, and we're distant just in terms of mafhum, mafahim, understandings of the religion. Such that yani, anyone can come and start chatting a bit of nonsense, you know what I mean? But you throw in, in a bit of qala, qala, fallallahu, you throw in a few like words that you're like, oh, 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 my man must know a bit. And suddenly now, khalas, he's the Sheikh of Islam of the British Isles. And he has one. And even if you are the Sheikh of Islam of the British Isles, it's not necessarily a place to be the Sheikh of Islam of, is it? <laughs> so, yani, yani, and warning to myself and to brothers and sisters, you don't hold conversation with people who are going to sort of yani, insult yani, imams and the works of the imams that the ummah has embraced generation after generation after generation to the highest degree. And there's no conversation there. There's no conversation about who Busayri is or about, who Bus um, about what Busayri's work stands for. Okay? Islamically, you said there are ten senses. Yani, yani, what are they? Yani, what, you mentioned ten senses, ten external senses: the sense of sight, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch, the sense of the smell, eh? sense of taste. There's sort of five external, and then you have internal senses, which is like the sense of sort of memory, the sense of contemplation. Okay, the sense of what's called the ishtiraq al his sense of like what's called the sensei, what brings all the senses yani, um, together. The, the, the memory, hifl, yani, a fikr, wa dhukr, wa dhikr, wa hifl, wa ishtiraq al his. Okay, those, those five, okay? So there's, there's the issue of, of memory, there's the issue of um, meditation or contemplative faculty, okay? There's the issue of remembrance, and there's the issue of what brings all of those sort of um, four internal senses together. If one of the people want to read about it in, in extended detail, it's in Imam, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, deals with it inside of his um, Ajaib al-Qalb, inside of his Wonders of the Heart, which is the 21st book of his Ihya ulum al 21st book, which is translated into English, I believe. Any questions, inshallah ta'ala? Naam. Yes, sir. I and how he 
on the box that it contagious. And he mentioned that one of the ways I was trying to compare it wasn't Imam Ali, who we find in the Hadith al Awwal of the Shamari in the Senate, the Sahih, by Imam Ali, who did he, did you speak of, who when he was looking for his teachers, he mentioned the name of the Prophet Muhammad, so a lot of things, and then he looked into the state of the, the, the person he was in front of before he made. This is the same with them. Is that the method that this great moment is said to use? Is it Imam Malik you spoke of? There's only one Imam Malik. Yeah. yeah. There's only one Imam Malik. Uh, and Rabbish Lat Naam. The son of Sayyid ibn Sa'id ibn Malik, Rabi al Ra'i, Anas ibn Malik, and Rasulullah Sayyid ibn Salam. That translation there. Uh, uh, we're very sorry because we've got limited time here. With us. I'm pretty sure we could stay here for hours and nobody would notice the, the clocks. That, that's the reality. And you can, I think, uh, imagine why we were so desperate to have Sheikh Ibrahim here and deliver these uh, monthly classes. So, Zakhmal uh, for attending uh, to let you know that next week, oh, sorry, not, I wish it was next week. Uh, next month, on Wednesday, the 6th of November, inshallah, in the same venue, we will be continuing on with the the, shah, the commentary of the Qasid al Buddha or the Qasid al Tashifa. As, we, as was highlighted. Um, Sheikh Ibrahim has actually made a request also from all of you, uh, which I think is a beautiful request, which is that if any one of you would like to write a poem in, in, in praise and love of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are welcome to do that. And even if you have the confidence, inshallah, out of love of him, alayhi salatu wasalam, then you can even read it in front of the class next month, inshallah. That's a big task. Uh, if you would like a recording, uh, of today's class and uh, the PDF of the handout, then please do email info at kpzinstitute.co.uk, inshallah. And uh, I would like to personally thank Sheikh Ibrahim for making this effort to come all the way from Liverpool to be with here in the, did you say, the land of the caves? That's what they say. Uh, I, 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 I think it's the Ummah the Mosul and myself. Uh, the Middle Nation, we're in the Midlands. And I want to really thank actually the KQZ Legacy Institute because make well for those brothers and sisters because it was, if it had it not been for them, this event really would not have taken place. Uh, and I'm sorry, I think it was a. You want to do the okay. uh, We're going to conclude the evening, inshallah, with a recitation of the Qasid uh, the Bunda. So I'd like to invite Brother Sufi Bhattar, inshallah, to, to come and end the evening, inshallah. Who comes from this? Oh. Yes, I think it's nice to end the evening with. Oh.